We long to see you, to be in your presence, to know you in uh, the very place you desire to manifest your glory. And you've qualified us to survive that. Not just to not be incinerated by your glory, but to be thrilled by it, to enjoy it, uh, to have our deepest longings and all of our affections met in you. Oh Lord, I pray that for all the days that we must wait here, until that day you take us home, would you make us faithful to cling to you, to make you known, to boast in you, uh, to invite others to this great joy which we have in you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In your notebooks, you should be looking at the focus of heaven. When we think of all the things to look forward to, first page of of notes disappeared somewhere. Here it is. Of all of the activities in heaven, of all the things that we'll partake in, um, no doubt the sweet reunions with the saints we've known, believers who have gone before us, and even reunions with those we've read about in church history or on the pages of the New Testament, Old Testament saints, uh, to gather together with all those who have been loved by God and who have loved God in return will no doubt be a really remarkable thing. Uh, To have crowns and rewards Uh, the evaluation of our lives, to have satisfactions and joys beyond comparison. To experience for the first time God's mindset towards sin, having been forgiven and cleansed, and then to look back. We see during the Great Tribulation, uh, during the outpouring of God's wrath uh, in Revelation chapter 8, verse 1, heaven was silent for half an hour. After all the singing, thousands of years of seraphim crying out, holy, 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 when when we are in God's presence and understand in a new way how he despises sin and how he will pour out his wrath on the earth dwellers, all of heaven is in awe and remains silent. I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to is having, having my perspective on everything eternally recalibrated. I know I don't think about things rightly here. Of all the things to look forward to, the, the greatest thing without which heaven would not be heaven is the presence of God himself, which changes everything. To be in the presence of his greatness and his glory to finally have the the whole purpose of God met, culminating the refrain of all of Scripture where God says, I will be their God and they will be my people and I will dwell with them and finally it comes to pass. This is the focus of heaven, the, the glory of God. This is a lot of the heavenly tourism books that flew off the shelves in the last decade have missed this point fundamentally that heaven is about God. It is about his radiating glory, the benefits that his creatures receive from being in his presence, from knowing him. The dwelling place of God has been God's aim from the beginning. How would he dwell with man, the the creature who bears his image? It begins in Genesis chapter 3, 8. Uh, we're gonna, I'm going to give you a list of scriptures here you can write down. In Genesis 3, 8, uh, we have the statement, and this is a statement after the fall, but God walking in the cool of the day in the garden, asking the whereabouts of Adam and Eve. He did not know where they were. He was inviting them into conversation about it. 
But it seemed to be the norm that before the fall, God walked around in the garden, conversed with his creatures. All of that lost in the fall. But it is exactly what God has aimed to regain. So Exodus 25, 8. God says to his people, let them construct a sanctuary for me with this purpose, that I may dwell among them. The point of the Mosaic law and all of the Levitical uh, rituals and the sacrifices and the structure of the tabernacle, that temporary tent they could uh, erect and take down and move from place to place, was so that God could dwell in the midst of his people and they could survive it. And God had this desire to dwell amidst his people. Exodus 29, 45, he says, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God. Exodus 40, 38, throughout all their journeys, the cloud of the Lord was on the tabernacle by day. There was fire in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel. In 1 Kings 8, 11, Solomon there is dedicating not a tent, but the temple, a more permanent structure for the dwelling place of God. And the cloud was there so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the crowd, for the, the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. So God had dwelt with Adam and Eve in the garden. He dwelt in the, temp, uh, the tent in the wilderness. And now he is inhabiting the temple in Jerusalem. In 1 Kings 8, 27, Solomon says, But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, how much less this house which I have built. Right? God's bigger than the universe, and he's going to come dwell in this little box, in this little city. Psalm 26, 8 gives a psalmist love for the dwelling place of God. O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Psalm 27, 4. One thing I have asked from the Lord and that I shall seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to meditate in his temple. Psalm 65, 4. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. All of Psalm 84 is a similar refrain. In Ezekiel 37, God makes the promise to Israel during the millennial kingdom that he will, in fact, restore Israel to their land and come and dwell in their midst through Messiah. He says, my servant will be their prince forever. That is Jesus ruling on the earth for a thousand years. He said, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them. And I will place them and multiply them. And I will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. My dwelling place also will be with them. I will be their God and they will be my people. And the nations will know that I am, I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forever. And we have this remarkable statement in John 1, 14. And the word became flesh and literally tabernacled, tented among us, dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So where has God dwelt? In the garden with Adam and Eve, in a tent in the wilderness, then in the temple, promised in the future for Israel, and yet comes in person and dwells among us. Tabernacles among us. Jesus made the promise in John 14, 3, I go and prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. A future promise of God dwelling with his people and yet in heaven Jesus expresses this desire in John 17. He says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you've given me, be with me where I am, so they may see my glory which you have given me, for you loved me before the foundation of the world. This longing in God, this plan of God, this desire of God to dwell with people, it's amazing. We have no business being close to God without being destroyed, and yet... It is his desire to be gracious and compassionate to sinners like us by being in our midst. 
1 Corinthians 3.16, Paul says, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? After Acts 2, the dwelling place of God takes on a new feature. The Holy Spirit permanently indwells believers. Jesus promised the Spirit would come. He said this will be a new thing. He has been with you, but now he will be in you. And from Acts 2 on, the Holy Spirit permanently dwells in believers. And in 1 Corinthians 3.16, the church collectively is called a temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, individual believers are called temples of the Holy Spirit. Paul says, do you not know that your body, singular, is a temple of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, singular, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own? And then, of course, all of this culminates in Revelation 21.3. I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be among them. God's expressed desire from the Old Testament to the New Testament has been to dwell with people, to qualify them to be in his presence, and to secure them for that end. Will we get to see God? Let me read to you from Exodus 33, 20. But God said, you cannot see my face, for no man can see me and live. And 1 Timothy 6, 16 says, God possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. And yet, what did Jesus say in Matthew 5, 8? The pure in heart shall See God. Old Testament songwriters express this as well. Uh, Psalm 42, 2, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before him? Psalm 63, 1 to 3, O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you. I've seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips will praise you. And of course, Isaiah 6, 5 says that Isaiah entered into the throne room of God and he said, I am am undone (laughs) for I have seen the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the King of glory. By the way, John 12 tells us that what Isaiah saw was none none other than the Lord Jesus Christ before he came to earth. God has promised to pour himself out for his people. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Isaiah 55. This is, I believe one of the places where the promise of the Bible is expressed. Here's God's invitation. He says, Ho, this is an attention-getting exclamation, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David. This invitation to come and drink from God who is said to be a fountain of living water is echoed when Jesus speaks to the woman at the well in John chapter four. If you knew who, you were, who was asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you living waters. Uh, That same thing is echoed in Revelation when God is amongst his people finally dwelling amongst them. Turn to Revelation 21. And notice how this is picked up in Revelation 21.6, this promise from Isaiah 55. Jesus declares, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. 
Here, the great promise of the Bible, given in Isaiah 55, is completed and fulfilled in these moments in Revelation 21.6. Jesus is the one who is giving to his people. There's a remarkable theology in God being an inexhaustible fountain. And it is simply this, we never give to God. We might think that in our strivings, in our efforts here in this life, that we're doing things for God. And, and we know what Ro, uh, Romans 11 says, that from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And God will yet be glorified in eternity future as he seeks to give and give and give, relentlessly give, emptying himself for the benefit of his creatures who don't deserve it for all of eternity. And this glorifies God to actually be the source of satisfaction and happiness and joy for his redeemed people forever. This is why God has expressed this over and over again from the Old Testament to the New. I will take you for my people, Exodus 6-7, and I will be your God. Exodus 29-45, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and be their God. Exodus 33, 14, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Leviticus 26, 11, I will make my dwelling among you and my soul will not reject you. Deuteronomy 33, 27, the eternal God is a dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. Psalm eleven seven: the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. The upright will behold his face. This whole idea of no man can see me and live is true in our present state. (laughs) And yet God is qualifying us to actually be in his presence and receive from him, behold his face, and see him. Psalm 1611, the psalmist writes, You will make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand there are pleasures forever. Psalm 17, 5, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Psalm 37, 4, God makes the promise, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. The psalmist Asaph in Psalm 73 says, whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you, I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart will fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In response to the truths in Psalm 73, Jonathan Edwards asked these questions. For what do you desire to go to heaven chiefly? What is it that you long for in heaven? He goes on to say, if you could have everything this world has to offer, If you could have long life, in fact, if you could live forever on this earth, have the best of relationships, all the best entertainments, the best foods, every recreation you'd like to have, and you could have them in undiminishing fashion forever and ever and ever, but you could not have God, would you take it? And Edwards goes on to say, what if all of the comforts, all of the joys, all of the delights of life were taken away from you? but you could have God. Would you take him? And these penetrating questions get at the heart of a genuine believer that responds to this great and glorious invitation of God who desires to be in fellowship with his creatures so that he can give and give and give to them. And the real test for our hearts is, is God my treasure? Do I long for him? You see, heaven is not just a pie in the sky escape strategy. (laughs) Something for us to think about to get through the mundane things of life. No, it is in fact a hunger for God. It's a longing for this promise, Jeremiah 32, 38. They shall be my people and I will be their God. It's a longing for that to be manifest, for that to be true in its fullest sense, for us to experience God's presence Finally, believer, when you see God, when you step out of time and into eternity, you will be exhilarated beyond your wildest dreams. It's impossible to conceive now how incredible heaven is going to be. 
And it won't be because you can fly or eat or work. It will not be because you will never get hurt. It will not be because you will never grieve or sin. It will be because your finite mind will be blown away by the incredibleness of something infinite in its greatness and goodness. The uncloaked presence of God himself. And it will be impossible to be disappointed. This is what Revelation 21.3 is all about. It is what all of the Bible aims at. It's what all of redemptive history is moving towards. It is the reason the universe exists. What is the essence of heaven? God giving himself to his creatures for their never-ending and ever-increasing good and for his glory. And heaven is the very desire of God. It is what he desires to accomplish. It is what he is bringing about. Revelation 21.3, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God will be with them. It's really a staggering thing that the creator desires to be located with his creation. God is omnipresent, And he seeks to manifest his omnipresence in a place so that his people can enjoy that presence. The incomprehensible God, the God who is fundamentally unknowable because he is transcendent and infinite and creaturely finite minds can't know a being who is transcendent and infinite. He is fundamentally incomprehensible. And yet the incomprehensible God desires to be known and desires to put himself on display for the benefit of his creatures. The invisible God desires to be seen. The independent God desires relationship. And listen, you and I are the beneficiaries of that relationship. Um, God doesn't get something that he doesn't already have in himself in the relationship. God didn't create because he was bored or lonely. In fact, if you want the kind of the bottom line answer on why did God create the universe, you need to read Jonathan Edwards' The End for Which God Created the World. It's in your uh, recommended resources list at the end of your notebook. God created because it is in his very nature to give of himself. And he created beings that could receive that selfless giving of himself for their benefit. And it glorifies his nature as a endless fountain of goodness. The infinite desires to be accessed by the finite. This is why Jeremiah 9.24 says, let him who boasts of this that he understands and knows me. Knowing God is the great privilege of the creature. God who said, Job 41.11, who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under the whole heaven is mine. God will never be debtor to us for the things we do for him. In fact, God is the giver. He's in need of nothing. He lacks nothing. He's independently happy in eternal triune fellowship. And yet, Isaiah 62, 5, as a bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And Zephaniah 3, 17 and 18, the Lord your God is in your midst, a victorious warrior. He will exult over you with joy. He will be quiet in his love. He will rejoice over you with shouts of joy. It brings God joy to give of himself to creatures. That is what we have to look forward to in heaven. Richard Baxter said this, Doubtless, this will be our everlasting admiration, that so rich a crown should fit the head of so vile a sinner, that such high advancement and such long unfruitfulness and unkindness can be the state of the same person, and that, and that such vile rebellions can conclude in such most precious joys. One pastor has said that while many people uh, express the thought that you'll be surprised at who's there, you'll be surprised at who's not there, um, I think it's right that we'll be surprised that we're there. (laughs) What am I doing here? 
I, I don't deserve this. I don't belong here. And yet, Jude 24, God has qualified believers through Jesus Christ to stand in his presence blameless with great joy. Which is an amazing statement. Up to that point in your Bible, you read people that entered into the presence of God and they fell down like dead men. And yet, because of the work of Jesus Christ, we get to stand in his presence with great joy. Richard Baxter says, what a high favor that God will give us leave to love him, that he will be embraced by those who have embraced lust and sin before him. But more than this, he returneth love for love, nay, a thousand times more. And he prayed this, may the living God, who is the portion and rest of his saints, Make these our carnal minds so spiritual and our earthly hearts so heavenly that loving him, delighting in him, may be the work of our lives. All right, you can turn the page. I don't know what's next. Is it questions? Um, kind of a blank page. You can just use this blank page. Um, one of the questions that I received uh, was, what are, the, what are the practical benefits of meditating on heaven? And, and maybe you've been thinking about some of those this week. Maybe you've been talking about those things already amongst yourselves. Um, if, if you've talked about one of those things, uh, we'd love to hear about it. Um, I'm gonna list a few and I'll give you some scriptures. And there are sermons behind all of these. So you can write down the topic, write down the passage and go write your own sermon and preach it to yourself, okay? Um, what difference does thinking about heaven make in terms of relationships? And you can just write down 2 Corinthians 5.20. We are ambassadors pleading with people. We beg you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Doesn't this change every relationship you have here? Materialism. Maybe the American dream. Uh, write down Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Don't store up for yourselves. William Carey, who was selling shoes while trying to convince all England to take the gospel to Papua New Guinea and other places. Somebody came into his shoe store and, and, and said, you know, William, you're gonna be able to sell more shoes if you quit talking about Jesus so much. His response, I only make shoes to pay the bills. My real job is to tell people about Christ. Thinking about heaven ought to change the way we pray. 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8. What does Peter say there? The end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. Above all, love one another deeply. Love covers a multitude of sins. Thinking about heaven affects our work ethic. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Thinking about heaven purifies, promotes godliness and holiness of life. 2 Peter 3, 10 to 18. That was 2 Peter 3, 10 through 18. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna borrow from John Calvin. Uh, and he's, he has a little work. I didn't put this in your resources. You should probably write this down. It's called Meditations on the Future Life. Meditations on the Future Life. And it's in his institutes. Um, I think you can also find this um, online, if you just Google Meditations on a Future Life, John Calvin. Um, if, you, if you just want the few pages devoted to this, you can ask Allie for it. She's got it on file, right? Isn't that one of the things we put in the trust notebook? Yes. Okay, so Allie has it. You can just ask her to email it to you. John Calvin talks about ways that God prepares us for eternity. And, and one of the ways he prepares us for eternity is by giving us good things. 
a great meal, great relationships, enjoyments in life. Uh, These are gifts from God that are common to all men. Uh, Theologians call this God's common grace. But believers have have a special avenue into God's common graces because we can appreciate the giver of the gift and not just the gift. So that a believer knows how to have a meal in a way an unbeliever doesn't even have a capacity for. A a believer can enjoy a favorite pastime, knitting or organizing or going to Disneyland or whatever it is, in a way an unbeliever can't touch. And what we ought to do, says Calvin, and he didn't actually specifically mention Disneyland, um, but what we ought to do when we get on uh, Space Mountain or whatever it is that you do, is you direct your heart and attention toward God in appreciation for the fact of enjoyment. Knowing that any enjoyments here are a foretaste of enjoyment that is to come. It's like an appetizer. Any good thing you experience here, whether it's a sweet relationship, a good conversation, a great meal, uh, some enjoyment, all of that is a a pre-minder not a reminder, but a pre-minder of what is in store for you, believer. And don't ever enjoy something without pushing forward to Isaiah 25, when God, the Lord of hosts, will assemble on this mountain a lavish banquet for all peoples. When you eat a meal, enjoy that. And enjoy it forward. Because this is what God has designed these enjoyments for. To, to pre-mind us of our home in heaven. Now the flip side of that, what is a hard day for? What, what is a trial for? What is a sickness for? What is a loss for? Says Calvin, these are reminders that this is not our home. This is not where we belong. And so I want to turn uh, your attention to 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 to get a picture of how thinking about heaven radically affects a bad day. And and, and a bad day is a way understated way to describe trials. But I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18. I need these verses. We need these verses. Paul writes, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory, far beyond all comparison. And so we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are unseen, the things seen or temporal, the things unseen, eternal. Verse 17 can be seen as something of a balance, set of balance scales. And two ideas are in the balance. Affliction in this life and a weight of glory in the next. Paul is comparing two things. He's comparing affliction with weight. And the affliction is described as momentary and light. Momentary and light affliction compared to eternal, glorious weight. Now, when I see the word affliction, I don't think of the words light and momentary. I don't know about you. Um, Those just aren't the right words to describe affliction. And yet, Paul calls affliction light and momentary. How is he able to do this? Well, notice the comparison. Light and momentary affliction are producing for us, this is active and it's personal, producing for us something. And the something is a weight, an eternal weight of glory, an eternal glorious weight. And here Paul is taking the Old Testament concept of glory, weightiness, combining it with the New Testament concept of glory, doxa is the Greek word, bright, refulgent light, and combining them together, we're, there is a significant glory that is in store for believers that is actually being produced by light and momentary affliction. And, and when we 
compare the glorious eternal weight, and notice these are opposites. Eternal is a contrast with momentary. Weight is a contrast with light. (laughs) Glory in contrast perhaps with affliction. When we compare these things, what is Paul's conclusion? Um, It is far beyond all comparison. And the Greek is literally hyperbole unto hyperbole. You cannot exaggerate this. You can't overstate the difference between these two things. One thing so tips the scale in its weightiness and significance that the other thing is just featherweight. And consider the Apostle Paul. You you can read 2 Corinthians 11 uh, later this evening and just look at the list of the things Paul endured. Hounded everywhere he went. Um, Beaten with rods. Stoned and left for dead. Shipwrecked. uh, The ship sunk at one point and he's treading water for a night and a day. Everywhere he went, he was in danger from his countrymen. He was in danger from strangers. He was in danger from robbers. There were enemies of the gospel and then there were just natural dangers. Everywhere he went and he did not stop preaching the gospel. Paul tells us in 1 Timothy 2.10, I will endure all things for the sake of the elect so that they may believe and by believing have eternal life. Paul knew what it was to be afflicted most likely decapitated by the emperor Nero at the end of his life, martyred for Christ. Paul knew what affliction was. How do you call this list of things in 2 Corinthians 11 light and momentary? Only, only when you compare it with an eternal weight of glory. All the things we've been talking about this week. Look at Romans 8.18. Same truth expressed just a little bit differently. Paul there says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Not worthy to be compared. In other words, we shouldn't even put sufferings now and glory then in the same sentence and try to make a comparison. It's not worthy to be compared. It's so incalculably contrasted that they shouldn't even be in the same sentence. And, and, and I know that, that is hard for us to grant here. <laughs> We live in a fallen, broken world. We experience loss. We suffer. We're afflicted. Paul himself said there were times where he was afflicted even unto death, despairing of life. He knew what it was like. And yet, he knew glory. (laughs) This isn't a shell game to try to say, oh, your suffering's not that bad. No, your suffering is awful. However, glory is so much infinitely better that they cannot be compared. And so we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. What is seen is temporary. What is unseen is eternal. I know people have said, uh, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I, I think it's impossible to think about heaven enough. I think it's impossible to think about heaven too well. People ask, If you're thinking about heaven all the time, then aren't you going to be unconcerned with the things of this life? No, I think just the opposite. You're going to be concerned with the things of this life in all the right ways, in the ways that matter for eternity. All right, now let's uh, let's take a look at some of the questions that you submitted. Feel free to raise your hand, ask a question at any point. Who did I prompt to ask the first? Okay, yes, Rebecca. Uh, Yeah, right now. I didn't expect you to ask that question. No, I did. Uh, Take out your notebooks. Uh, Several people asked this question. Um, We didn't really uh, put in in the notebook, when is heaven? When does this all happen and in what order? But uh, in here somewhere, page 23... charts and diagrams. 
Okay, turn it sideways. Okay, everybody see the cross on the left side? Dot, dot, dot means a whole bunch of time has passed between the cross and the you are here marker. Okay? This is us right here on that dot. You are here. At some unspecified amount of time, nobody knows. If somebody tells you they know how much time fills in this next square, they're wrong, run away, don't listen to them. Okay. Um, the, the red arrow going up from the cross represents the Lord Jesus Christ, his ascension. He is presently at the right hand of the Father, interceding on behalf of believers, preparing a place for us. Um, and he is, he is in, heaven, in heaven, that is the throne room of God. And, and this, is, this where is where believers, believers who have, who have gone, home, gone home, who have been, who have been swallowed, swallowed up by life, by life uh, uh, for whom for mortality, mortality is over, is over the perishable, perishable is done. Is done. Um, um, Paul says Paul to, says to absent be absent from the body, from the body is, what? is what? To be present, to be present with, the with the Lord. So for, so now, for now, prior, prior to, the to the rapture, rapture resurrection, resurrection event, 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 believers, believers who, who die in the name of the Lord, are without a resurrection body. Paul still awaits a resurrection body. My dad awaits a resurrection body. Janet's mom awaits a resurrection body. Our friends who are with the Lord, who, by the way, we're not sad for them. We're sad for us. We're really sad for us. They await the resurrection. Like we await the resurrection. But, Paul says, it's better by far. You, you feel this tension in Paul in Philippians 1, uh, where he says, um, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Um, leaving this life as a Christian is not loss. <laughs> we feel the loss here but it is all gain. And that's why Paul told the Philippian believers, yeah, I'd really rather go be with Christ, but I know that my service to you would be more helpful for you, and so I'll stay. <laughs> and that's not really his call to make, but you hear that tension in him. I, and, and maybe after this weekend, you're feeling, I, I just want to go home. I want to be done with sin. Uh, uh, but I, I want my kids to follow Christ. I, there's things to do. It'd be better for me to be there, but does God have service for his glory for me to do here? That was Paul's tension. I hope you feel that tension. That's a good tension. And so in between the up arrow where Jesus ascended to that kind of fish hook red arrow that comes down and swoops back up, in between those moments, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Right? Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. No resurrection yet, no body yet but with me. By the way, that's conscious. Mental acuity, the real you, right? You know the real you is not the flesh and bone stuff. It's the immaterial you. Um, I don't know what it's going to be like to be bodiless. I've only ever had a body, right? Um, but we don't want to project into the future the uncomfortabilities that we suppose might be with that. Does that make sense? Um, in fact, if the Bible says it's better to be bodiless and to be with Christ, then we go, yeah, that's better. Um, by the way, um, we're, we're not going to miss these bodies. To be absent from this body is to be home and to be with Jesus. And there's another one coming because God designed the human being to be not a bodiless existence, but an immaterial and material person fused together for all of eternity. There's just a period of time where we wait. Right? So in between the two red arrows there, the up and then the fish hook down, is a waiting period, conscious, full of enjoyment, um, present with the Lord, reunions with saints, but awaiting uh, the resurrection rapture event. So the fish hook that comes down, uh, it's kind of shaped like a harpoon on purpose. Because the Greek word for rapture, if you, I don't know if you've ever looked up rapture in the Bible and said, rapture's not in the Bible. Um, it is. 
uh, caught up together, snatched away, seized. Some of your translations say the Greek word is harpazo. And it means to snatch away or seize, which is why it gets kind of the harpoon. It's where we get our word for harpoon. Kind of the harpoon-shaped hook. It's a, it's a violent, and, and not in a bad way. It's not a harmful way, but it's, a, it's a, uh, a strong, fierce activity of Jesus coming and snatching away his people. And, and we read about that in 1 Thessalonians 4, John 14, 1 to 3, 1, Th- 1 Corinthians 15. In the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. Um, etc. And 1 Thessalonians 4 tells us that the dead in Christ will go before those who are alive and remain. So uh, those who have already gone to be with Christ, absent from the body, present with the Lord, they will get their resurrection bodies before believers who are here on the earth. Okay. Um, sometime after that, and we don't know if it's immediate or if there's some gap there, um, the world gets judged. God gets to have his day. And the day of the Lord, which uh, comprises a number of events related to the end time, from the tribulation to the millennial kingdom to the uh, final squelching of Satan and all the enemies, um, the Lord will have his day. And all the detractors, all the, all the rebels, all the earth dwellers who have thought they were God and wanted to do things their own way, um, they will see God prove himself and vindicate his name during that time. It will be the worst period of time, according to Jesus, that the earth has ever known. And we've seen a lot of bad times. 20th century was a bad time, right? Uh, The 1100s were a terrible time if you were in Europe. Uh, There have been lots of terrible eras in human history. This one will be worldwide, cataclysmic, unmistakable, the worst of the worst of the worst in human history. Right before the best, (laughs) When Jesus himself returns to the earth, that's the other big red arrow, that's Revelation 19, that's the end of the tribulation. So if, you're, if you um, outline the book of Revelation, who was in my small group when we did this? Barb Pagel, do you remember, and Jamie Siegel, do you remember the outline of the book of Revelation? Kind of. You remember it, Barb? You want to try it? Try the outline? Yeah. What do you mean, try the outline? She knows that I won't put her on the spot. Yeah. No, like how the book of Revelation is outlined. What's in each chapter? Remember when we did that? It was, it was so memorable. Okay, I'll give it to you right here. Uh, Revelation chapter one is the vision of Jesus Christ. The vision of Jesus Christ. Revelation two and three are the letters to the seven churches. Revelation four and five is the scene in heaven. Revelation six through 19, slow down. Revelation six through 19 is the great tribulation. Revelation 19 is the return of Jesus to the earth. Revelation 20 is the thousand year reign of Jesus on the earth from Jerusalem reigning over the nations. Revelation 21 and 22 are the new heavens, new earth. It's chronological. Just read it left to right, it works. Where were we going with all that? Oh, the worst, <laughs> worst period of human history is followed by the best period of human history where Jesus actually rules the world. You know, every beauty pageant contestant has said, what do you want? World peace. Well, it's coming. (laughs) They're going to get their wish, and it's Jesus. And he will sit on David's throne in Jerusalem and rule the nations with a rod of iron. And this is a time period described by lots of portions of your Bible. The, the thousand year duration is only given in Revelation 20, but the events, the characteristics, the purposes of it, and the rule and reign of Messiah on the earth, producing world peace and a Garden of Eden-like setting, while still under the curse, still under the, the, the existence of death before new heavens and new earth in Revelation 21 and 22. It's not the end. It's not the, the, the best there will ever be, but it will be the best that has ever been. And it'll be glorious. Um, nobody asked, um, but you should have. So I'll ask it. <laughs> Won't it be weird in the millennial kingdom um, to have glorified saints in glorified, resurrected, immortal bodies along with mortal humans who still sin with Jesus physically present on the earth as the, uh, the king of the earth, uh, operating the government of the world, um, and then to have Satan locked up 
And then really, won't that be weird? That can't be how it works. That's just weird. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> just because it's strange to our senses doesn't make it not true. In fact, the, the first three centuries of church history, the dominant view among theologians and pastors in the first three centuries was that Jesus would reign for a thousand years on the earth in the millennial kingdom. That, that doctrine has um, fallen by the wayside in our day. Grace Bible Church is a little bit weird for still believing it. <laughs> um, in, in fact, the early church fathers believed it so strongly, they actually thought, you know what, and, and I don't follow their exegetical method, but I do think it's interesting. They actually said, you know what, um, God created the, the, the earth in six days and he rested on the seventh. And they proposed that the 4,000 years of Old Testament history could be combined with 2,000 years of New Testament history and then a Sabbath rest of 1,000 years for the millennial kingdom and then the eternal state. This is in print. It's what they wrote about in the first three centuries. Um, and, and then politically other things happened and the, the dominant view became that uh, actually, no, we're building the kingdom now. The, the kingdom of God is on the earth. Uh, Constantine being the emperor and the uh, centralization of power and the church and government all together in Rome uh, sort of gave everybody the idea. See, look, this is the golden age. We're actually building the kingdom. We're doing kingdom work. I'm not comfortable with that phrase in our day. We're not building the kingdom. Tis to, to usher in in Revelation 19. He's just gonna come here and it's gonna be the kingdom. Right? We can populate the kingdom through evangelism. Okay, that's another story. Um, but something very interesting happened in, in, those, in those first um, centuries of, of church history where people started to believe that the kingdom is now and the church is the kingdom. They actually held to a literal thousand year reign of Christ. The problem was about the year 1000 was about the worst era in church history. Uh, the plagues in, in Europe, uh, multiple popes believing bad doctrine, the denial of the gospel, the persecution of genuine believers, the burying of the Bible under tradition and a foreign language, essentially. Um, <laughs> this, is, this is not the reign of Christ on the earth. Um, and after 1000 a, a AD, then the, the uh, duration of the millennial kingdom which six times in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 20, verses one to six, six times, uh, John says it was a thousand years, a thousand years, a thousand years. Um, all of a sudden that became metaphorical. Okay, I'm, I'm way off the map here, um, answering my own questions. Let's get to some of your questions. <laughs> yes. When I say that, and I use that same nice three-point outline, yeah. I really like it. I just mean personally. Personally freed from the presence of sin. In other words, in, in me. Not presence of sin in the universe. Okay. So yeah. Be Correct. Correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, can't wait to find out. <laughs> and, and here's a couple lines of evidence to think through that. John 14, one to three, what does Jesus say? I go to prepare a place for you so that you will be with me where I am. And we know that that uh, new Jerusalem, that city, that place he's preparing doesn't come down to the new earth till after the millennial kingdom. So there's a, a thousand year gap there at least. Um, and so for anybody who is with Christ now, um, you're already experiencing that place. Um, during the millennial kingdom, Christ comes down to reign on the earth. Um, where do glorified saints hang out? Um, in that new Jerusalem that hasn't come down out of heaven yet, um, which is ostensibly our home at that point. 
Um, but Jesus says to his followers, um, you will, the, especially the, uh, the, the apostles, you will sit on the uh, uh, thrones and reign over the 12 tribes of Israel during the kingdom, meaning the millennial kingdom. So try to put all of that together. My take is that the new Jerusalem will be our home in heaven proper, and we will have responsibilities on the earth and the kingdom. And just as uh, angels, even right now, um, have their place in heaven, and they have responsibilities down here. Um, I don't think it's far removed from reality to think that our role might be something similar. Yeah, I can't wait to find out what is the transport system like? How long does it take? What does it look like? <laughs> it must be, must be lots of flying. I think Jacob's ladder was a zip line. That's a great call. All right. Somebody asked, when an unsaved person dies, do they go straight to hell or a holding place until judgment? Okay, that's a, that's a good question. Um, the lake of fire, uh, when, and again, we use heaven to describe a lot of different things. We use the word hell to describe several different things as well. Um, technically, Hades, Hades uh, is the holding place for unbelievers when they die until they get a resurrection body fit for the lake of fire, which is properly called hell. Um, nobody populates the lake of fire until the great white throne judgment in Revelation 20 except for two people, the beast and the false prophet. They're thrown in alive at the end of Revelation 19, and they wait that out a thousand years um, and ostensibly have a, I don't know if they have their resurrection body at that point or if they get resurrected at the end of that and brought before the great white throne. Um, but the short answer to that is uh, a holding tank. And by the way, Hades is not a uh, unconscious state or a peaceful place. Um, Jesus describes it in his parable about rich man and Lazarus. And you can read about that in the gospel of Luke. Can't remember the chapter. Is it Luke 16? Thank you. So, Amy. So you're talking about the dead in Christ? Do their physical bodies go up? Yeah. Well, technically, a reconstituted glorified body goes up. So they get glorified body. Mm -hmm, right then. Because I was, in my head, I'm thinking like, you've got like a full tribulation, like millennial kingdom with like bodies worshiped up somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and um, the human body doesn't last very long without decomposing. Um, the, the point is God reconstitutes, recreates a new glorified body right then. And, and for those who are alive during the rapture, you don't experience death. You are changed in the twinkling of an eye, 1 Corinthians 15. Okay, what else is on here? Go ahead. Okay, one more time. I'm sorry, Rebecca. Okay, so prior to Christ's death and resurrection, mm -hmm. the people that believed in the promise of the coming Messiah, mm -hmm. because I mean, there are Christians who still believe in the rapture, but when they, like Abraham, you know, they believe in the promise of the coming Messiah. So they were trusting in God's future redemption of them. It was still in the promise. Did they go straight to heaven? Or yeah, great question. Okay. Yeah, so Rebecca's question is, what about Old Testament saints? Where do they go when they die? Great question. And just to, to be very clear, Old Testament saints get saved the same way New Testament saints do, by God's grace, through faith. Now, the object of their faith was not as clear as ours, right? They were looking forward to something. And when God said, trust me, I make provision for sin by a substitute. And a, and a genuine Old Testament believer trusts God um, placing his faith in God's provision of a substitute to take care of sin, recognizing the blood of bulls and goats don't actually take away sin, but a contrite heart, you know, David's prayer in Psalm 51 reflects the, the genuine believer's apprehension of what's really going on behind the scenes. But 
The death of Jesus Christ on the cross pays for the sins of Old Testament believers. It's the only way they got saved. Um, God applies that to them. Now, what happened to them when they die? Well, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Same principle holds. Um, what are some lines of evidence for this? Uh, Matthew 17 and the transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go up to the high mountain with Jesus. Jesus is uncloaked before them. Um, he, the, the, the real Jesus is kind of manifest in bright, blinding light. Who's there with Jesus talking? Moses and Elijah. Okay, Ja or Sha? Ja. ja. Okay. Whew. Now, how how do Peter, James, and John know what Moses looks like? Is it does he look like Charlton Heston? I mean, does he have a name tag? <laughs> what? Some of you got that. What do you mean, the guy that works for the NRA? Is Moses? <laughs> Thank you. But these were real people having real conversation, not with resurrection bodies. And they were present and manifest and visible, and the disciples knew who they were. I mean, Peter, big mouth Peter, says, hey, we could make three tents, one for you, one for you, one for you, because he didn't know what he was saying, right? So that, that would be one line of evidence that Old Testament believers are conscious and with the Lord. Um, David's psalms are full of resurrection hope, right? Um, Job expressed resurrection hope. Um, what, is, what is Job's line? Anybody remember it? I know my Redeemer lives. Yeah, and I'll see him. There was a song about that sometime. Okay, yeah, that's the Luke 16 passage. Um, Abraham's bosom is just a way to describe um, presence with the Lord. Yeah, and, and it was important in, um, you know, the, the uh, Jewish patriarchy um, to be buried with his fathers. You see that refrain through the kings, he was buried with his fathers. There's an um, anticipatory hope in death of going and being present, and I think Abraham is the kind of figurehead of Israel. Uh, by the way, Abraham, after the Tower of Babel, is the first person God enters into covenant relationship with as a, I want to have a relationship with people. And he just pulls him out of idolatry in Babylon and says, you're going to be a people. Um, so Abraham kind of stands at the head of those who would follow and believe. So. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, is the implication with the ga there's gates and nothing comes through the gates that is defiling. That means there must be things outside the gates that could defile. Um, that's not a necessary implication. Um, it, it's a way to say there is no way anything's getting in here that's unclean, impure, liar, immoral, etc. Um, where are all those people? They're in the lake of fire. Yeah, impossible for anybody to sin at that point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But and and by outside the gates are all those people, um, meaning outside in the lake of fire, which he clarifies in the same chapter. So. Oh my goodness. Okay. Mm. Okay, when we die, you have the first death. Now, is the second death, the, well, the second death is the final judgment. Correct. Okay, now, do we, we go to, we're pushed over to Hadim, so we're waiting for that final judgment? Believers are not. Hades, yeah, Hades is only for the wicked dead. 
and a, and a place to hold them until Revelation 20 and the reading of their crimes, um, their absence from the Lamb's book of life and their, whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So yeah, Hades and lake of fire are only for unbelievers. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. It was a race last time. Everybody, did you all have the same question? You, oh, you were helping Cynthia. Great job. You got my attention. Well done. Teamwork. Okay. Who do we reign over? I see that question. Anne handed me that question a few minutes ago. Um, the saints will reign on the earth. Um, they will reign forever. We will reign with him. Um, if we're in charge, who's under us? Right? It's a great question. The Bible doesn't actually say, doesn't give a direct object for the saints will reign over, I don't know. What we do know from Scripture is that humanity is the, on the highest rung of God's created order. Higher than angels, higher than the living creatures, um, higher than giraffes and rocks and asteroids and whatever else you can imagine. Uh, only humanity, not the four living creatures. Um, if, if cherubim are a different order of being, um, not the cherubim, uh, not the myriads of angels in all of their hierarchies. Um, they're fellow slaves with believers, um, but they are not image bearers. And so um, humanity was designed by God from the very beginning with God's stamp on their person to rule and reign and govern the created order. This is the mandate that God gave to Adam in the garden. Um, he gave to Adam and Eve, multiply, fill the earth, and what? Subdue it. The, I love the Hebrew word there, kabosh. Put the kabosh on it. Um, and, and what was the created order then? It was very good. Reigning uh, in, in the garden did not mean put a bunch of evildoers under your thumb and get them in line. It just meant subdue a good creation. Um, be like God, be a, a sub-region under God's reign to govern the earth. And I think that probably has something to do with industry and cultivation and gardening and creativity and, and all the things that um, will make work fun in heaven. Um, we, we might be having angels do things. Um, that's what Paul alludes to in 1 Corinthians when he says, he says, don't sue each other. Can't you guys figure out stuff without going to the secular law courts? Don't you know? Actually, I didn't know. Um, you're going to be judging angels? Paul, I didn't know that. Um, but it's, and again, it's not that angels are bad or sinful, um, but um, reigning and administrating over the created order is part of God's purpose for man. Will we sleep in heaven? Was that the one you were going to ask, Allie? Okay. Will we sleep in heaven? Um, heaven is called a rest, right? Jesus says, enter into your rest. Um, I don't think we'll need to sleep. But you know those moments when you're just exhausted and you can finally get horizontal and close your eyes and that feeling of work is done, nothing needs to boggle my mind right now and I can just let it all go, Calgon take me away. How do I know that? I don't know. Um, and I can just rest the relief that a good sleep brings will be what we experience all the time right the run and not grow weary um, wh what a great sleep feels like will be a full sprint across the green hills headed towards the snow capped mountains um, and, and I think that's true of, of all of the enjoyments we could imagine from heaven. We try to project, what do I enjoy here and what's it going to be like there? Um, it's not the thing, right? The enjoyment itself isn't the thing. There's a, there's a joy and a satisfaction provoked or produced by some enjoyment. Um, there, there's a sweet relief in sleep. Um, and, and again, these things are all hints and 
preminders of what is to come. Um, it is a, a rest in God. Um, it is a joy, a relief, a lack of weariness in God, a new strength um, that will all be there. Allie, what was your question? Great question. Will we know everything when we get to heaven? Yeah, but it'll take us forever. <laughs> we will always be finite. Some people have had the misconception that when you get to heaven, uh, we will be out of time. We will then be timeless. That's not what the Bible depicts, right? The silence in heaven for one half hour, right? There's singing in heaven. Singing requires meter, requires time. Um, there are lots of indications. The, the tree of life gives 12 different kinds of fruit in its seasons, right? So we never become omnitemporal, right? We will always be finite, located to a given moment and a given location. And we will still always have finite capacity to think. Now, we'll be a lot smarter then than we are now. And we will, I don't believe we'll forget and so I believe we will continually accumulate knowledge and the knowledge of God. This is Jesus defined eternal life as knowing him. Um, but we just won't ever exhaust his infinite nature. Finite beings forever. So will we know God accurately? Yes. Will we know him exhaustively? Not for a long time, meaning not forever. We'll keep growing in that. Okay, that's a good question. Um, I don't have the verse um, off the top of my head. Isaiah speaks about um, God doing something with memory and, and bad memories, and, and, and forgive me, I don't have that off the top of my tongue, uh, top of my head. Um, but look at Revelation 19. You want to read it for us, Barb? It says, um, the dead will not live, the departed spirits will not rise. Therefore, you have punished and destroyed them, and you have wiped out all remembrance of them. Okay. Yeah, I think that's probably a, a remembrance of them on the earth. Um, one example of a fulfillment, that was Isaiah. Um, one example of that is the... Um, uh, Nineveh was the capital of the Assyrian Empire. The Assyrians were enemies of Israel at that time. Um, Assyria was so wiped off the map and so forgotten by human history that uh, up until the early 20th century, um, scholars, archaeologists, believed the Bible was a fraud because we knew there was no Assyrian Empire and there was no Nineveh. Bible can't be true because those things don't even exist. That's how... <laughs> wiped off the memory they were. Then eventually we found the Assyrian Empire and the capital city of Nineveh. And then they said, well, we don't believe the Bible anyway. But so I think that's probably temporal memory reference. Um, uh, Renee, was this you that asked this question? Um, can I ask a follow-up? Um, is your concern, is your thought, will we remember people that we loved who are not in heaven? Well, because there's no more mourning or sadness. Yes. Yeah. How can we, how will you be able to remember them without the sadness of them not being there? That, that is a tough question. And Jonathan Edwards devoted an entire Sunday morning sermon to that topic. And if you, if you get his um, uh, Banner of Truth, two volume works, there's a sermon, and I don't remember the exact title, but it's something like, um, how will there be no weeping in heaven um, if my mother is in hell or something like that. Um, and with pastoral tenderness, um, he approaches the question from two sides. Um, one, it's appropriate to weep over sinners here. Um, Jesus himself, who knew what would happen, wept over Jerusalem. 
And he had great sorrow in his heart over a rich young ruler who walked away and didn't believe the gospel. And it's appropriate to follow our Lord in these things and to grieve over sinners here. And Jesus is the judge who will stand and pronounce condemnation for sinners, full of his glory and righteousness and justice. And so um, Edwards, I believe, turned to Revelation 19 um, in this sermon. And the text here says, after these things I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belongs to our God. Because, verse two, why are we worshiping God right now? Because his judgments are true and righteous. For he has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth with her immorality and he has avenged the blood of his slaves on her. And a second time they said, hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. The 24 elders, the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to God, all you his slaves, all you who fear him, the small and the great. Hallelujah, our Lord reigns. Um, earlier in the book of Revelation, you have the, the martyred um, tribulation saints crying out to God, how long, O oh Lord, until you avenge our blood? So on earth, this side of glory, we weep for sinners. And, and Jonathan Edwards comforted his people with this truth. When you're in God's presence and you understand glory from his perspective, we will have a different perspective and we, we won't weep. Um, it, it's hard to fathom now and I don't want to take that tension away. It should be hard to fathom now because we're here and we weep. Um, but just tuck this away. <laughs> In Revelation 19, when the saints say, hallelujah, God, your judgments are right um, because you're pouring out your wrath on the harlot. The, the harlot in Revelation 19 is the, the world system opposed to God being judged by God and it's populated by piano teachers, mailmen, you know, the, your neighbors. It's people. Um, so I don't know if that's comforting. It's comforting for me in a distant sense. I, I, I know that I will, um, closer to God's glory, understand things from his perspective better. That's a good. That's a good question, and and I don't know, Allie, to what degree we'll remember specific iniquities. Um, what do we know about our God? He chooses to forget them. He puts them out of His mind. Um, and and in the throne room of God, in the courtroom of God, um, Romans eight tells us it is God who justifies. Who is He that condemns? And the answer is nobody. Um, so it seems that God has cleared the courtroom of our iniquities. Um, made us unaccusable, stand blameless before him with great joy. And yet, who is our savior forever in eternity? A lamb standing as if slain. So Jesus still will bear the marks of his sin-bearing work. Will I remember my crimes that inflicted him? I, I don't know. God won't. But the fact that we were sinners and we were rescued and we were rescued by that one, our Savior, will always be the center of our worship. I don't want to remember my sins. Some of you have talked about God's kindness and grace in your life um, just by way of testimony that you can't remember a lot of things that you did that were awful. Just God has um, taken care of some of those memories and that's, that's kind All right, maybe two more. Okay, Allie. Will we organize in heaven? I don't know.
to them, but they are not. Is there something I just want to start saying before I tell you? Let's close in prayer. <laughs> in, in your New Testament, most often when you see the word God all by itself, you're talking about God the Father. Most often. There are a few exceptions to that. but um, Jesus at the right hand of God, it, it's okay to think uh, the Son at the right hand of the Father. Um, and, and spatiality is not the real issue there. Uh, the right hand for an ancient Near Eastern king was one of authority, power. The, the right hand man, as it were, um, had all the authority of the king vested in him. Um, so the, the role of the second person of the Trinity, Jesus is said to be the image of the invisible God. Um, the role of the second person of the Trinity is to be the visible manifestation of the Godhead. Um, so, I don't know. Okay. Cameron. <laughs> I'm scared. I don't know what you're going to ask. I don't know of any verses to point to. We do see some scenes where the occupants of heaven are paying attention to earthly events. But I don't know that we have anything specific in terms of an individual in heaven looking down on their family. And I don't know. I think about that one a lot. You know, picture of my, my dad hangs over my office. I wonder if he sees this. I don't know. Uh, one uh, last question um, that somebody asked and submitted uh, last week sometime. Uh, how do you describe heaven to children? Any thoughts? Cameron? <laughs> Yeah, it, and, and the presence of God isn't the only thing the Bible describes about heaven, but it's far and away the best. <laughs> um, on, open your notebook to the page that has resources, recommended resources. I need to add two to that um, that I left out. By the way, my favorite is Richard Baxter's Saints Everlasting Rest. Um, that's a free PDF download if you Google it. Um, to the top of your list, just write my Bible. <laughs> Far and away the best resource. To, to study God is to study what heaven is all about, right? So get to know him and you'll long for heaven. There's a, there's a relationship between your heart longing for heaven and how you are doing, tracking in your pursuit of the Lord personally. Those things go together. Man, I, I'm, I'm so temporal-minded. I'm just distracted all the time, not thinking about heaven a lot lately. What's going on? Well, how's your hunger for God? Right, those are related. Um, and then at the bottom of the list, add Thomas Boston 
Thomas Boston, and the book is called Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. Human Nature in Its Fourfold State. And it just walks humanity from garden to post-fall pre-conversion to post-conversion to eternal state. So you go from sinless to sinless um, in terms of what is man. Um, so uh, his description of the garden and his description of the fall, his description of conversion and his description of glory um, were just revolutionary in my thinking about man. So um, commend that to you. It, 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 it kind of puts your Bible together in a way where you see, oh, oh, the, the first two pages of my Bible and the last two pages of my Bible, the, all the stuff in between is how do we get from, it's, it's fantastic. So, all right, Anne, again, I'm over time. Um, I have one more question. Oh, Jamie has one more question while Anne is walking up okay, yeah. to do whatever. Where is Anne? Anne's not even here. Ask more questions. Go. Oh, she's here. Okay. Jamie, go ahead. Um, when you talk about, this might be kind of a dumb question, but just our relationship with one another in heaven. So I, we know that mm. we're not going to be married any longer. So will I see my husband in heaven as, hey. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm so thankful for? Because this question resonates. Does this question resonate? Yes. Um, Janet and I have this conversation a lot. I'm so thankful that every time we talk about heaven or I teach on heaven, this question comes up in our conversation, which means she enjoys being married to me. What a blessing. That's just good. If she were saying, man, I'm really looking forward to heaven. To die is gain. <laughs> I'd be worried. Um, this goes back to the thing and the other thing. Um, we, <laughs> we will all be married. We, collective humanity, the bride of Christ. Um, and, and what's beautiful about marriage, what, what every good marriage points to in its goodness is an intimacy and union and fellowship that will be met in Jesus Christ. It's not exactly your question, but that's the overarching thing under which this question happens. So what will my relationship to Janet be like? Well, she's been my best friend in this life. She's the one with whom we've walked through things and experienced things. And I can't imagine uh, an eternal existence not populated by those memories and those experiences, Evan, having walked through the first things, the old things, the old times together. And, and they were this long. But, but she was whom God gave me. And so um, my relationship with Janet and Janet's relationship with me will be better in every single way in heaven. Um, I can't sin against her anymore. Um, I will love her. Okay. Go. <laughs> it'll be good. It'll be good. I don't know exactly what it'll look like, but it'll be good. Or, and what about with, like, with each other? Like, we'll know each other. Like, yeah. Heaven, heaven will be relational and personal and intimate. <laughs>